America is relatively near future, as the author saw it in the early 50s, when this novel was written a dystopia. 30. Year old Guy Montauk is a firefighter. However, in these modern times, fire brigades do not fight fire. Quite the opposite. Their task is to find books and put them on fire, as well as the houses of those who dared to keep such sedition in them. For ten years now, Montauk has been fulfilling his duties regularly, without thinking about the meaning and reasons for such book hating. Meeting with the young and romantic Clarissa McClelland knocks the hero out of the rut of his habitual existence. For the first time in many years, Montauk understands that human communication is more than an exchange of memorized lines. Clarissa stands out sharply from the mass of her peers who are obsessed with high-speed driving, sports, primitive entertainment in Luna Parks and endless TV series. She loves nature, is prone to reflection and is clearly lonely. Clarissa's question, are you happy? Makes Montauk take a fresh look at the life he leads, and with him millions of Americans. Pretty soon he comes to the conclusion that, of course, this thoughtless existence cannot be called happy by inertia. He feels emptiness surround him, the absence of warmth, humanity. It seems to confirm his guess about the mechanical, robotic existence of an accident with his wife Mildred. Returning home from work, Montauk finds his wife unconscious. She poisoned herself with sleeping pills, not as a result of a desperate desire to lose her life, but mechanically swallowing pill after pill. However, everything quickly falls into place. On Montauk's call, an ambulance quickly arrives, and medical technicians promptly perform blood transfusions using the latest equipment, and then, after receiving the required $50, they leave for the next call. Montauk and Mildred have been married for a long time, but their marriage has turned into an empty fiction. They have no children, Mildred was against it. Everyone exists by himself. The wife is immersed in the world of television series and now enthusiastically talks about the new venture of the TV crew. She was sent the script of the next soap opera with the missing lines, which the viewers themselves should fill in. Three walls of the living room of the Montauk house are huge television screens, and Mildred insists that they spend money on installing a fourth TV wall, then the illusion of communicating with TV personalities will be complete. Fleeting meetings with Clarissa lead to the fact that Montauk turns from a well-oiled automaton into a man who confuses his fellow firefighters with inappropriate questions and remarks, such as, there were times when firefighters did not burn houses, but on the contrary, extinguished fires. The fire brigade goes on another call, and this time Montauk is shocked. The hostess of the house, caught in the possession of prohibited literature, refuses to leave the doomed dwelling and accepts death in the fire along with her favorite books. The next day, Montauk can't bring himself to go to work. He feels completely ill, but his health complaints do not resonate with Mildred, who is dissatisfied with the violation of the stereotype. In addition, she informs her husband that Clarissa McClelland is not alive, a few days ago she was hit by a car, and her parents moved to another place. In Montauk's house, his chief, Firemaster Beatty, appears. He sensed something was amiss and intends to put in order the broken Montauk mechanism. Beatty gives his subordinate a short lecture, which contains the principles of consumer society, as Bradbury himself sees them, the 20th century. The pace is accelerating. Books are shrinking in volume. Abridged edition. Content. Extract. Do not smear. Hurry to the denouement. The works of the classics are reduced to a 15-minute transmission. Then even more, one column of text that you can run through with your eyes in two minutes, then another, 10 to 20 lines for an encyclopedic dictionary. From the nursery straight to college, and then back to the nursery. Of course, such an attitude towards printed materials is not a goal but a means by which a society of manipulated people is created, where personality has no place. We should all be the same, the fire chief inspires Montauk. Not free and equal from birth, as stated in the Constitution, but just the same. Let all people become like each other like two drops of water, then everyone will be happy, because there will be no giants, next to whom others will feel their insignificance. If we accept such a model of society, then the danger coming from books becomes self-evident, a book is a loaded gun in a neighbor's house.
Burn it. Unload the gun. It is necessary to curb the human mind. Who knows who will become a target for a well-read person tomorrow. Montauk understands the meaning of Beatty's warning, but he has already gone too far. He keeps books in the house that he took from the house that was doomed to be burned. He admits this to Mildred and offers to read and discuss them together, but does not find a response. Guided by Faber's instructions, Montauk leaves the city and meets with representatives of a very unusual community. It turns out that something like a spiritual opposition has long existed in the country. Seeing how books are being destroyed, some intellectuals have found a way to create a barrier to modern barbarism. They began to memorize works by heart, turning into living books. Someone solidified Plato's state, someone Gulliver's travels by Swift, the first chapter of Henry David Thoreau's Walden lives in one city, the second in another, and so on throughout America. Thousands of like-minded people are doing their job and waiting for their precious knowledge to be needed by society again. Perhaps they will wait for their own. The country is going through another shock, and enemy bombers appear over the city that the main character recently left. They dump their deadly cargo on it and turn this miracle of technological thought of the 20th century into ruins.